is Mike Bellamy with Passage Maker and the China Sourcing Information Center. We're going to cover small orders, small order strategies today. I'll be joined by my good friend, we call him the office warrior, Dr. Terry Carter. He'll be joining us today, kind of silent type, but might have a few things to say later. Um, today, we're going to cover three things. First, very brief introduction to the China Sourcing Information Center. Second, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and why I was asked to present today. And third, the most important thing, of course, is we're going to cover the challenges and solutions for small buyers in China. Now, when we say small order, small buyer, it really depends on your industry if you are small, medium, or large. For example, if you have $10,000 US dollars worth of underwear in China, you can probably go factory direct. But if you have $10,000 worth of highly customized equipment for an iPad accessory, most likely you won't be able to go direct. So there's no golden rule for what is small and large in terms of buying power. But generally, if you don't have the buying power to go factory direct, meaning you don't meet their minimum order quantities in China, then you're the target audience for this presentation. So we're talking about how can you go China direct if you can't necessarily go China factory direct. Okay, first off, let's go through the three strategies. Now I'm going to cover them in great depth today, but just so you can understand what I'm talking about. If you're buying off the shelf, meaning you're purchasing a product and what you buy from the supplier is exactly what you sell, it's not customized in any way, that's off the shelf. And that's the most easy um, product type to buy in China. A little bit harder is something I call tweaks which is in the middle of off the shelf and highly customized, you're taking a, for example, a wireless mouse and you're adjusting it a little bit. You're putting a new brand, but you're not changing the size or any of the technology, that's a tweaker. The most difficult buyer when you're small, the most difficult situation is if you're small and trying to go factory or China direct on a highly customized product. Say you're taking a mouse, but you're adding some new technology. You're going to put in a GPS tracker, so if your coworker steals your mouse, you can track them down. That's something that's very difficult. But during today's presentation, we're going to cover all three strategies, off the shelf, highly customized, and tweaks. OK, a bit about the Information Center. Um, the China Sourcing Information Center is a nonprofit organization. It's sponsored by a host of corporations in China, but the tools and techniques available in the video tutorials, the Ask the Experts, the blogs, the white papers, um, even the monthly mailing that gives an update to our 40,000 subscribers about what's happening in China sourcing this month, all of that is free of charge. Um, if you do need support in terms of sourcing services, inspections, engineering, sourcing agencies, that type of stuff, you can find our list of endorsed service providers on our website at the bottom. Also, while it's not hosted by the China Sourcing Information Center, we're very happy to uh, tell you about a new website launching this month called the SupplierBlacklist.com. God forbid if a supplier ever does you wrong and you want to tell other buyers about it, now here is a resource. Okay, when I go to a presentation, I hate it when the person giving the talk stands up there and tells you about what an expert they are and how great their company is. I hate an infomercial and I promise you, you won't get that today. But I would like to explain a little bit about why I was asked to cover this topic of small buyer strategies. Well, for one, I'm a purchasing agent in China. Most of my customers are purchasing between a million and $20 million US per year, but we do have a group of customers that are on the smaller side yet need to go factory or China direct. So today I'm gonna to walk you through some of the tools and techniques that we use at my sourcing agency. Also, before I started my agency, I was a small buyer myself. I've been living in China now for 12 years. This is where I raised my, my family. I made a lot of mistakes when I was a small buyer, so today I'm going to tell you about some of them, as well as the best practices I learned along the way. Okay, now the good news is that finding a supplier and getting a quote in China is pretty straightforward, and it's free thanks to globalsources.com. You can go to websites online, type in the product you want, you want to buy, um, wireless mice, and you will get a list of 100 potential suppliers. The problem is, that as smaller and smaller buyers go China direct using free websites like globalsources.com, we're cutting out a lot of intermediaries. And we're coming across barriers where perhaps the Chinese suppliers aren't interested in taking our orders because they have minimum order quantities in place. So the good news is it's easy to find suppliers, 
The bad news is it's hard to convince a factory to take your order when you're a small buyer. Now let me explain why. Why going China direct or factory direct especially is not right for everybody. First off, you know, there are minimum order quantities. A large factory that is used to dealing in container loads isn't going to be interested in an order of 500 units of baseball caps, things like that. Also, keep in mind that the price which you pay at a unit level is highly um, influenced by the raw materials. And if your order size is small, your supplier doesn't have any leverage with his raw material supplier. As such, he can't give you a, there's no volume discount because there's no volume. Keep in mind that it's good that more and more buyers in the USA, Europe, and around the world are going China direct, but keep in mind that as we go China direct, we're cutting out those intermediaries, the local distributor back home, the importer, um, the trading company, all of those firms that ideally were providing a service. Now, in the long run, going China direct is good. It lowers costs for the whole supply chain. It cuts out the weak links. I hate it when I, I do business or I hear about some Hong Kong trading company that acts as a broker but doesn't provide any real value. Those guys are getting cut out and I, I'm all in favor of it. However, as a small buyer, we need to realize that when we cut out those people, sometimes they were providing real services, providing financial terms, providing the quality control, putting a warranty on the item, um, arranging the logistics, the customs clearance, things like that. So when we cut them out of the supply chain, we need to realize some of those costs and um, the project management side of things now become our burden. And we'll talk about that today. Also, some other bad news, the cost of going China direct, um, you look at separate your set price, meaning the unit price versus the project management or the, the, uh, the costs of finding and managing suppliers. For example, your setup costs are fixed. Regardless if you buy one unit or a million units, you still have to do the testing to make sure the product is safe. You still have to, if it's customized, open the tooling. There's sampling fees involved and most importantly, documentation. Do you have a, a quality manual in place to help the factory understand what is and isn't acceptable? So whether you're making one unit or a million units, you have to organize all of those things and it costs money, unfortunately. So there are, there are fixed costs that can't be avoided just because you're small. So the goal of my presentation today is, uh, now I want to keep it informal, um, not too technical, put everything in layman's terms, but I'd like to explain how to determine if your project is a good fit for going direct to China. Assuming the answer is yes, then we're going to develop a sourcing strategy to make sure that you have a higher likelihood of success. Please keep this in mind. If at the end of the presentation you say, you know what, I didn't realize that there are so many um, barriers to going direct to China, maybe it's not right for me. Actually, that's a lot better off than if you get involved in a China supply chain and later find out, whoa, you don't have the budget to do it right and you expose yourself to a whole lot of financial loss and headaches. So if at the end of this presentation, if you say to yourself, maybe I should just source domestically until I get a little bit larger, believe me, that, that's not a bad decision to make. But for those of you that after the presentation realize that it's time to go direct to China, let's decide, is your project a good fit for going China direct? So you ask two questions. One is, is China ready for you? Meaning, is the bill of material, the raw materials, the components, are they readily available? Do they have the production technologies? For example, um, if you have a very high-end product, let's just say it's an electronics and you need a battery that's only made in Japan, a solar panel that comes from Korea, you need some uh, specialized chemicals that are all only available from Dao in New Jersey. Those components may not be available in China, so the product might not be able to be made even if you found a supplier in China that says they could make it. So if you have certain technologies or core components, do a little bit of research first to make sure that those components are available. Now, if you go to Walmart and you pick up product and you turn it over and it says made in China and it's very similar technology or quality standards to what you want to make, then you're safe. 99.9% .9 of the time, China is ready for you. And the bigger question is, are you ready for China? When I talk about are you ready for China, we're really addressing do you have the budget and the skill set to manage the supply chain. And let me go through um, a little bit more detail. So as I mentioned before, you're cutting out intermediaries when you go direct to China. 
Um, keep in mind that these costs often cannot be avoided. Things like sampling. In the past, maybe your distributor would give you some free samples for, for your um, confirmation and for your reference, for your decision making. It's very rare, unless you're a big buyer, that the supplier is going to give you a bunch of free samples. Also keep in mind that now you're probably going to need to go to China a couple times to find and manage those vendors. That has cost. Product safety, so important. Before, there was a distributor who was the importer of record into your country. If anything went wrong, uh, a product recall, a child was hurt by your product, something like that, most likely he would share or absorb the liability because he was the importer of record. Now, when you go direct to China, you're the importer of record, and if anything goes wrong, God forbid, the lawyers and the local governments are not going to go after some Chinese supplier. They're going to go after you, even if that Chinese supplier tells you, oh, don't worry, our product conforms, it's safe, we have global liability. <laughs> like a U.S. lawyer is going to try to uh, get a Chinese-based uh, seller into a U.S. court case. It doesn't happen. You're the one that has the exposure as the importer of record. Now, if you're buying from China Direct, you're responsible for international shipping, obviously, but that's a whole other skill set. Um, how to clear customs, how to arrange a freight forwarder, all of that stuff. It's not that hard, um, but if it's your first time, it can be a little bit intimidating. Also, since we're cutting out the middlemen, now it's up to us, the small buyer, to do things like audit the factory to make sure they really can make the product they say they can make. Do the inspections to make sure that the product coming off the assembly line is exactly what we wanted to buy. Due diligence to ensure that after we place the purchase order, the supplier is, or the trading company, or whoever the seller is, is in financial standing enough so that they won't go out of business before the order is complete and disappear with our... our um, our deposit. So the harsh reality is that you and I as small buyers, we need to focus on the all-in cost of production. Don't be seduced by the siren song of low unit price. For example, you might see this back home for 50 bucks and you find it online at a website for $25 and you're thinking, wow, I'm going to make a huge killing. But then you realize you might have to spend a couple dollars per unit on shipping. What about the, the thousand dollars you need to do some auditing? What about the 25,000 US dollars needed to um, register yourself as the official licensed importer? So there's a whole host of surprises that can come about because you're cutting out middlemen. Okay, so um, let's see, we covered this one already. Now let's go to the, some of the strategies in terms of putting together a budget to determine, can I go factory direct or not? Do I have the budget and experience? It's a bit of a long list, but I would like to go through it because these are things you can't really avoid. You have to have these bases covered if you're going factory direct. So the first is um, auditing the factory, making sure before you place the purchase order that they're a legitimate factory. In China, this is the country that built the Great Wall. They recently put a man in space. In theory, anything is possible in China. But in practice, has your supplier really had experience making a, um, a wireless mouse, for example? You might contact a trading company that deals in textiles and say, I want a wireless mouse. Most likely because they think they can make some money and organize it behind the scene. They're going to say, sure, no problem. We'll organize a wireless mouse. That's a recipe for disaster. So you want to do your auditing to make sure that the who's ever selling to you, whether it's a distributor, a trading company, a wholesaler, actually has experience with the product you want to buy because everyone will say that they can do it. Now, what does it cost? Well, if you fly yourself to China and spend a couple days at the factory, hotels, food, and the, and the transportation, it can be done for under $3,000. It's great to go visit the suppliers, build that relationship, see what's really going on. Now, the good news is, if you don't want to fly over there and you're on a tight budget, for a couple hundred US dollars, third parties can um, come in and, and do an audit on your behalf to confirm that the factory has the ability and experience to make a given widget. But you need to do an audit, either on your own or with a third party, before you place the purchase order. Next is, is more due diligence, confirming that the supplier is financially stable. Um, so you do this after you do the quality audit. You make sure they can make it. Then you want to confirm through due diligence that they're a reputable company that's not going to run away with your money. Um, so asking for references, Mr. Supplier, I'm looking forward to do business with you. You meet my quality expectations, but I want to understand if you're a sound business. Can you give me a couple referrals from happy customers? It doesn't cost you anything to ask. 
If you want a detailed background check, the company that I use is CBI Consulting. They're American-owned, China-based. And for a few thousand dollars, they'll give you a lot of detail about the supplier. How long have they been in business? Who actually um, owns the company? Do they have any outstanding debts or lawsuits? Now, for small order buyers, that might be a little bit extreme. But if your order goes over ten, twenty, a hundred thousand dollars, it's really important to know who you're dealing with in China. So due diligence is a key step. Okay. Speaking of uh, key steps, it's so important that you have a proper purchase order. I meet a lot of small buyers at the trade show. It's the first time placing an order in China, and they don't have a, a written template for placing the order. They send an email to a supplier: "Give me 3,000 units of this wireless mouse." Now, what is the exact specification? What are the the inco terms? What are the lead times? All those details. If you don't write it down. And clearly explain it to the Chinese supplier. Most likely, it won't happen. So, issuing a purchase order in the form of a phone call or email is dangerous. You need a real template that defines what are you buying, what are your quality expectations, lead time ex expectations. So, get yourself a English-speaking Chinese lawyer. Don't go to the lawyers back home. They will charge you tens of thousands of dollars and outsource it to a Chinese lawyer, anyways. Go find a Chinese lawyer that speaks English, based in China, and for a few hundred U.S. dollars, you can get a proper template made up for your purchase order and purchasing contract. Another thing to keep in mind in terms of upfront costs are samples. Now,、um, not only do you probably need samples to confirm that your product meets your customer's expectations, but you want to have a sample on hand so that when the order is delivered, you can compare and see if it's exactly what you agreed. Now, if you are doing anything customized, then you're going to need to do prototyping. The cost of sending samples and prototypes back across the ocean, you're dealing in FedEx, which is getting more and more expensive. So, build into your budget the cost of developing prototypes or at least getting confirmation samples back and forth. If your product is light, great. But if you're dealing in something bulky and heavy, this can be a, a real、um, impact on your budget. Next, you need to confirm that the product is safe and conforms with your standards. For example, your country standards—not just your company standards, but your countries. For example, if you're dealing in anything with electronics, for the Europe, it's going to have CE; for the US, a UL certificate to make sure that it's,、uh, you know, somebody that holds the product is not going to be injured, that it meets basic requirements for safety. So, even if the factory says that it's UL approved. You're the, as usual, you're the importer of record, so it's up to you to confirm that that UL is valid and that the product is actually safe. I've seen lots of small, sloppy suppliers in China simply stick the CE and UL mark on a product that has never been tested for conformance before. But the buyer thinks, oh, it has this mark on there; it must be must be safe. Think again. It's up to you to confirm that that that、um, certificate is still valid and the product is safe. Luckily, it doesn't cost a lot of money when you work with testing labs, but it is a fixed expense that you shouldn't avoid if you want to source safely. Okay. Other basic expenses you should build in is to protect yourself in terms of the liability if the quality isn't achieved by using a third-party inspection agent before you make that final payment and before the goods ship out of China. You want to know if there are defects before it arrives on your dock.、Um, so. You can go to China, as mentioned, you know, a couple thousand bucks to make the visit, or you hire a third party. The one that I use is Asia Quality Focus. For two hundred ninety-eight dollars, they can visit a factory anywhere in China and do an inspection for you. So, don't, you know, if you're sitting here saying, "Well, my my product, my project is kind of small. I don't have a thousand dollars to spend on quality control." Then that's a big red flag indicating that maybe you're not ready to go China direct. Okay. Here are some small ones. Keep in mind that when you're paying suppliers, you're not handing over cash, and they don't use checks in China. So most likely, you'll be sending a transfer or a TT, a teletransfer, from your bank to your supplier's bank. Now, one of the mistakes I made early on in my career is I didn't ask my U.S. bank, "Hey, how much does it cost me to send the money to China?" I just did it, and then I realized I was getting hit with fifty, sixty dollars for each bank transfer. So you might send a hundred bucks. To pay for some samples, and it turns out that sixty bucks goes to the bank for their fees. That can get really expensive. So what I encourage you to do is ask your banker, "Hey, I'm going to be doing more and more business with China. Can you give me the corporate rate?" 
on the transfers overseas. And it can go down to as low as $15, especially if, if um, your bank is the same bank as the Chinese use. For example, HSBC does a great job for me because a transfer, interbank transfers, has a low, low rate. Okay, finally, when you place a purchase order in China, that's the beginning, not the end, of the China supply chain management. When you place an order domestically back home, you basically sit back and wait for the product to show up. In China, you're responsible for the project management, unfortunately. Don't expect that your supplier is going to give you updates and give you uh, information about, hey, production kind of had a problem this week. Do you have any suggestions? They're not going to be open about uh, the status of production unless you ask and get really involved. So, for example, who in your team is going to follow up with a supplier once a week to get to the status of things, to solve problems, to clarify specifications? It's not that big of a deal if you're buying something that's off the shelf, but if you're tweaking or anything customized, who pays for the project management is a real big issue. So, what is the value of your time? Now, at the, at the bottom line, as a rule of thumb, I like to um, say 5K to play. Meaning, if you don't have 5,000 US dollars in your budget set aside for managing a China direct relationship, it's going to be difficult to do it safely. So, um, you know, these are the basics that you really shouldn't be avoiding if you want to source from China safely. Okay, is China ready for you? Great. Are you ready for China? Yes. Now, finally, let's get to the strategies. Everybody that's buying from China is worried about the holy trinity of sourcing, meaning regardless if you're large or small, everybody's worried about price, quality, and lead time. The fourth component is uh, intellectual property that some of us are, are worried about if you're dealing in any type of customization or if you have intellectual property that you want to protect, but everybody's worried about price, quality, lead time. So my strategies today are going to cover those four bases. Keep in mind there are different strategies for different types of purchases. We have off-the-shelf, highly customized, and tweakers. Let's do strategies for highly customized projects. You now manage your expectations. When you're a small buyer and you have a very technical, highly customized product, it's a lot of headaches. It's not easy, and it's so essential that you get your hands on a better understanding of those upfront costs. So you really have to think about the all-in cost of your project. For example, if it's new, you want to get it engineered right so that your supplier knows exactly what you're making. Do you have clear specifications? Do you fully understand what materials are in place and the tolerances? So engineering costs become a major factor. You need to register your intellectual property if it's something that you, you want to protect and not have knocked off. Um, so important, if it's new or highly customized, and if it's never been imported into your country before, then you need to confirm that the concept is valid in terms of it meets the requirements of your marketplace as well as the local government. Will your new idea fall apart when used for a year in the market? Does this product conform to all compliance with the government so that it's safe, it doesn't hurt anybody? So that costs money. Um, you know, the price, if it's a new product that hasn't been made before, the factory might give you a quotation, but if they've never made it before, they might have difficulty holding that price once production starts. The same is true for lead time. If they've never made it before, how do they know how long it will take to make? So when you're dealing with highly customized or totally new products, um, it's much more fuzzy in terms of managing the interior, true costs, lead times, and price. So get ready to roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and work these things out with your supplier. Hopefully uh, earlier on than at the end of the supply chain, so there won't be too many surprises. So as I mentioned before, are you ready for China is really important that question must be asked if you're doing anything that's highly customized. Off the shelf, tweakers, it's important, but here it's so important. Basically, to cut to the chase, you have two options. Option one is that you find a way to get involved at the factory because if the product is new, very specific standards, new technology, you need to find a conduit to convey to the factory. And if you're dealing with a, a trading company, for example, um, maybe they don't have the experience. It might, in some cases, if you're technical, you have engineering, good design skills back home, go factory direct. Um, the other option is to find a really good broker or trading company that's going to manage the project as well as the ongoing coordination. So somebody has to manage the factory to explain it. And the options are you do it or you find a third party. 
Now, when you think about it, actually, the cost, the all-in cost for both options are roughly the same. If you're going to go factory direct, then maybe, yes, the unit price, well, actually, the unit price is roughly the same whether you're dealing with do-it-yourself or going, to the, going through an intermediary because at these small volumes, the price which the factory sells to you or sells to the intermediary is roughly going to be the same because bill material volume and such. But when you go factory direct, maybe you're not paying for the support of the intermediary, but you're spending more of your time, more transportation to get you over to China, more midnight phone calls, more FedEx packages back and forth, more headaches. So when you hire a good intermediary, yes, they should remove some of those headaches, but you're going to need to pay them a fair, um, either a percentage commission or perhaps a monthly retainer. So either way, it's going to cost. But the worst case scenario is if you didn't find a good intermediary. So now you're paying an intermediary, but if they screw up the project because they didn't explain to the factory very well, you're wasting so much money. So. If you find a good intermediary, that's going to save costs. If you find a bad broker, a bad trading company, bad agent, oh, that's the worst case scenario because the, what will happen is you'll, you'll miss your lead times. The product won't be designed right. You'll have to start over, perhaps. All right. Well, I think we can get this done in the, in the 7% uh, energy that I have left on my battery. Don't worry about that. Okay. I told you I wouldn't talk a lot about my company, but I did... I didn't say I wouldn't promote my book. So here's a shameless uh, plug for my uh, The Essential Reference Guide to China Sourcing. It's basically a manual full of templates and uh, supplier contracts, audits and such. Um, if you need help, especially if you decide you're going to do it yourself and manage the supply chain from he your own headquarters rather than using a third party, then this book was designed to help people that want to manage the supply chain on their own. Okay. Um, if you take away just three things, one, manage your expectations, especially if you're a small buyer of customized product, it's going to be hard. Second is make sure that you have the right partners in place. The last thing you want is to find the wrong intermediary or to find the, the wrong partner that's going to help you manage the supply chain. If they don't have the experience, it's going to screw things up. So make sure that you get references from any service providers in the mix. Um, and most important, Regardless of who you're dealing with, lay out the roadmap and the project gates and structure the payment to performance. When they achieve these certain gates, then they get paid. You don't want to pay everything up front and you don't want to put it all at the end. You need to, to spread out the payments over the course of a, a product to get it to market um, in a way that there's incentive for your partners in China to get it right. Now, we don't have the opportunity in this video format to do Q&A, but there's my email, mikeb at psschina.com. Send me an email. I'll be happy to answer your questions and do my best to point you in the right direction if I can't answer them in-house. Well, that's all we have today. If you like these videos, we have uh, 30 other ones of different topics at the China Sourcing Information Org, China sourcing info org. Check it out. Wish you successful sourcing in China. Okay, let's talk about now strategies for highly customized projects. Now manage your expectations. When you're a small buyer and you have a very technical, highly customized product, it's a lot of headaches. It's not easy, and it's so essential that you get your hands on a better understanding of those upfront costs. So you really have to think about the all-in cost of your project. For example, if it's new, you want to get it engineered right so that your supplier knows exactly what you're making. Do you have clear specifications? Do you fully understand what materials are in place and the tolerances? So engineering costs become a major factor. You need to register your intellectual property if it's something that you, you want to protect and not have knocked off. Um, so important, if it's new or highly customized, and if it's never been imported into your country before, then you need to confirm that the concept is valid in terms of it meets the requirements of your marketplace as well as the local government. Will your new idea fall apart when used for a year in the market? Does this product conform to all compliance with the government so that it's safe, it doesn't hurt anybody? So that costs money. Um, you know, the price, if it's a new product that hasn't been made before, the factory might give you a quotation, but if they've never made it before, they might have difficulty holding that price once production starts. The same is true for lead time. If they've never made it before, how do they know how long it will take to make? So when you're dealing with highly customized or totally new products, 
Um, it's much more fuzzy in terms of managing the interior, true costs, lead times, and price. So get ready to roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and work these things out with your supplier. Hopefully uh, earlier on than at the end of the supply chain, so there won't be too many surprises. So as I mentioned before, are you ready for China is really important. That question must be asked if you're doing anything that's highly customized. Off-the-shelf, tweakers, it's important, but here it's so important. Basically, to cut to the chase, you have two options. Option one is that you find a way to get involved at the factory because if the product is new, very specific standards, new technology, you need to find a conduit to convey to the factory. And if you're dealing with a, a trading company, for example, um, maybe they don't have the experience. It might, in some cases, if you're technical, you have engineering, good design skills back home, go factory direct. Um, the other option is to find a really good broker or a trading company that's going to manage the project as well as the ongoing coordination. So somebody has to manage the factory to explain it. And the options are you do it or you find a third party. Now, when you think about it, actually the costs, the all-in costs for both options are roughly the same. If you're going to go factory direct, then maybe Yes, the unit price, well, actually, the unit price is roughly the same whether you're dealing with do-it-yourself or going, to the, going through an intermediary because at these small volumes, the price which the factory sells to you or sells to the intermediary is roughly going to be the same because the bill of material volume and such. But when you go factory direct, maybe you're not paying for the support of the intermediary, but you're spending more of your time, more transportation to get you over to China, more midnight phone calls, more FedEx packages back and forth, more headaches. So when you hire a good intermediary, yes, they should remove some of those headaches, but you're going to need to pay them a fair, um, either a percentage commission or perhaps a monthly retainer. So either way, it's going to cost. But the worst case scenario is if you didn't find a good intermediary. So now you're paying an intermediary, but if they screw up the project because they didn't explain to the factory very well, you're wasting so much money. So if you find a good intermediary, that's gonna save costs. If you find a bad broker, a bad trading company, bad agent, oh, that's the worst case scenario because the, what will happen is you'll, you'll miss your lead times, the product won't be designed right, you'll have to start over perhaps. All right. Well, I think we can get this done in the, in the 7% uh, energy that I have left on my battery. Don't worry about that. Okay. I told you I wouldn't talk a lot about my company, but I, did, I didn't say I wouldn't promote, promote my book. So here's a shameless uh, plug for my, uh, the Essential Reference Guide to China Sourcing. It's basically a manual full of templates and uh, supplier contracts, audits, and such. Um, if you need help, especially if you decide you're going to do it yourself and manage the supply chain from your own headquarters rather than using a third party, then this book was designed to help people that want to manage the supply chain on their own. Okay, um, if you take away just three things, one, manage your expectations, especially if you're a small buyer of customized product, it's going to be hard. Second is make sure that you have the right partners in place. The last thing you want is to find the wrong intermediary or to find the, the wrong partner that's going to help you manage the supply chain. If they don't have the experience, it's going to screw things up. So make sure that you get references from any service providers in the mix. Um, and most important, regardless of who you're dealing with, lay out the roadmap and the project gates and structure the payment to performance. When they achieve these certain gates, then they get paid. You don't want to pay everything up front and you don't want to put it all at the end. You need to, to spread out the payments over the course of a, a product to get it to market um, in a way that there's incentive for your partners in China to get it right. Now, we don't have the opportunity in this video format to do Q&A, but there's my email, mikeb at psschina.com. Send me an email. I'll be happy to answer your questions and do my best to point you in the right direction if I can't answer them in-house. Well, that's all we have today. If you like these videos, we have uh, 30 other ones of different topics at the chinasourcinginformation.org, chinasourcinginfo.org. Check it out. Wish you successful sourcing in China. Have a great day.